Hey guys, it is Patrick. And before you dive into this intermediate accounting lesson, I wanted you to know that you can actually download the notes for this section and specifically this lesson that you're about to watch if you head to my website at www.patrickleemsa.com or you can head over to the description link that's below and I'll put that link to those notes below where you can find them, download them, and print them, and follow along as you watch this lesson. So go do that, and here is your intermediate accounting lesson. All right, in this lesson, we are gonna go over the elements to a financial statement. We're looking at the overall look of the financial statement and some of the assumptions that we would make on the financial statement, as well as some principles that we need to abide by as we prepare these financial statements. So let's take a look at what our 10 elements to the financial statements are. So SFAC6 defines 10 elements of financial statement. These are the elements that construct the financial statements overall. Now, the 10 elements of the financial statements can be categorized into three categories. The first one being assumptions. So we've got four assumptions that we need to understand. We also have four principles that we need to understand. And then we finally have two constraints. We kind of introduced you to those in the last lesson, but we'll cover it again in this lesson. So let's take a look at some of the assumptions here. So assumptions are things that are assumed when reading the financial statements. They do not need to be told to you because it's already there. So what we're saying about assumptions, these are things that we can assume about a financial statement when we're reading them. The first one here is the economic entity assumption. We've got the going concern assumption. We've got the time period assumption, and then we've got the monetary unit assumption. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look at each one of them individually. So economic entity assumption assumes that business is accounted for separately from other business entities, including its owner. It also assumes all data related to the entity is being reported in the books for that entity. So what we mean by that is if we take an example of a small company, a small company oftentimes has an owner and that owner has started that company and it's not public, there's no other investors. And the economic entity assumption would assume that the books for the company are separate from the personal books of the owner, meaning that I shouldn't see the, see the owner's mortgage on the company's books. I shouldn't see meals and entertainment expense that the owner did personally on the books of the company. They are separate. The reason why I bring this up is too often as an accountant, I've seen owners who don't understand this will commingle their funds. And then we've got this rent payment that's on the books that is duplicated. And I'm like, why do you have two rents? And then the owner goes, well, one of them is actually my personal home. One is my business and my accountant says that I can do that false, you can't do that. But then that doesn't accurately give us a picture of what's happening in the organization. That's an additional expense on the organization that shouldn't be there. So when we're looking at financial statements, there is this assumption that we're looking at the results of the financial operations for the company and the company only. Now, if we have multiple companies within one larger conglomerate, we can consolidate them. That's okay. But we also shouldn't have two non related companies consolidated into one financial statement. Then we also have this going concern assumption. Accounting information reflects a presumption that the business will continue operating instead of being closed or sold. And the reason why is when we're looking at, for instance, depreciation. You buy a new car, and if you depreciate it over 10 years, for instance, you might depreciate maybe $1,000 um, a year. But if you um, if you try to go trade it in or sell it, it usually is going to be worth way less than your cost allocation and depreciation. When we're looking at the financial statement, the assumption that we look at is that we're going to continue using that asset for a very long time. So it doesn't matter what the fair value of that asset is. So we tell you to take the asset and put it in the books at cost, which is not reflective of its fair value. Usually it's really not effective because it's usually more than its fair value. 
And so what this says here is that if there is a growing concern, meaning that we don't know if the company is going to be in business any longer or um, longer than the next year, then we want to see the financial statements not at cost, we want to see it at fair value. What can you actually get for it? Well, in your books, it says that it's worth $3,000, but in reality, you're only going to get $2,000. What's more important if you expect that the company to dissolve in the next year? You don't care about the $3,000. You only care about that $2,000. So we want to make sure that um, or we the assumption is the company is going to last for the foreseeable future. And if it's not, we need to put disclosures in our books saying that this company has a going concern. The next assumption here is the time period assumption. Life of a company can be divided into time period. So what this says is that when we're looking at the financial statements, the assumption is, is that all the expenses, all the revenues can be effectively broken into different time periods. So annually, quarterly, monthly, whatever we're reporting should be able to break that up to a company's uh, life cycle. So, um, which is mostly what we do is we break it into annually and we make sure we close out the books and we can put different expenses into different periods based on when we actually incurred those expenses. The monetary unit assumption expresses transactions and events in monetary money units, typically in the unit where the company is headquarters. So when we're looking at the financial statements and we see dollars, we're assuming that that's where all the fight, all the numbers are reported in a monetary unit, in this case, US dollars. Now, this is the where this is usually an issue is if you have a hyperinflation type of company, meaning they're in a they're in an area where there's hyperinflation. So when you report $35,000 in the books, that's not really $35,000 because tomorrow it's hyperinflated to $90,000. So in those cases, we're going to need to translate their hyperinflation into a stable currency like US dollars so that we can actually compare the results from one period to another. Hyperinflation doesn't really help us because sure, yesterday it was $35,000 thousand today is ninety thousand but what does that actually mean well that might actually only mean a five dollar jump if we use the stable currency so monetary unit we express everything in a monetary unit when it comes to financials um, and that we are able to do that on a stable currency. Now we talk about principles here. Principles talk about when things should happen, especially when it comes to when transactions are booked into the accounting system. The first one that we have is the measurement or the cost principle. The second one we have is revenue recognition principle. We also have our expense recognition principle and then our full disclosure principle. With our cost principle, you, you've you learned this, um, you learned really all of these in principles. The cost principle tells us that accounting information is based on actual cost rather than current value or potential value. So when we buy an asset, we book it into our books at cost. The revenue recognition principle tells us that revenue is recognized when it's earned. Earning process is normally complete when services are performed or a seller transfers ownership of a product to the buyer. Now it gets more complex here with the change in revenue recognition policy, but it, it's a good starting point for when we talk about revenue recognition. So did we earn it? Well, if we earned it, then we book it. Expense recognition, a company records the expense it incurs to generate the revenue, uh, revenue reported. So we book expenses when we've incurred them. We incurred them, not necessarily meaning that we paid them. So we might have incurred the expense, but not have paid it. We're still gonna book it into our books when we've incurred it, not necessarily when we paid it. Full disclosure principle tells us that companies should report the details behind financial statements that would impact a user's decision. We call that um, making sure that we disclose everything that a company needs to disclose to their shareholders from a materiality, materiality standpoint, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Now, with those elements, the, what's the print? So we've got our assumptions, we've got our principles, now we've got our cost effectiveness or our constraint. So we've got two constraints here. One of them is a cost effectiveness. We talked about this in the last lesson. We're bringing it back here because it's one of the elements to the financial statements. So accounts want perfect financial statements for their external users. However, one of the main constraints is cost versus benefit. The cost of producing that information in financial statements must outweigh the, sorry, yeah, the cost of 
cost of providing the information on the financial statement must outweigh the cost of providing that information to external users. So there must be some benefit that we gain um, in order to report that cost on our financial statement. And then lastly, we've got is materiality. Materiality is the notion that information will make a difference in the decision being made by the information user. We should only provide information that is material in nature to the information user. So that has to do with a little bit of the cost effectiveness. If it's not material, uh, we don't need to report it. Well, what is material? So what I like to use as an example is assume that you're a poor college student, you're coming to class and you have a $100 bill in your pocket. You walk out of the classroom and you accidentally drop that $100 bill on the floor. Would you be, would you be mad? You probably would be mad because that's a hundred bucks and you're a poor college student. Well, let's flip the situation. Let's assume that you are a millionaire and you'll lose that hundred bucks. Would you be bad? You might be upset for a little bit, but you won't be mad because you have that $100 is not necessarily material to you. It is material to the student, but it's not material to you. So when we look at a financial statement, what is material to the investor, what is not material to investor? And we compare that against the financial statement. So I'm not saying that if we leave this off, it would make a difference in this investor versus this investor when this investor has lower capital and this has higher capital. But what we're saying when we're looking at the financial statement as a whole, is it material to other accounts or other amounts presented? Hey guys, thanks for watching this lesson. If you enjoy what you saw, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to write something in the comment section below like, I don't know, what's your favorite superhero? If you are looking for the next intermediate accounting lesson, make sure you click on this button right over here. And if you wanna to head to my website and see all of the lessons that are available, make sure you head to my website right here. Until next time, we'll see you in the next video.